Welcome to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatoric Seminar. Today, we are really happy to have uh, Anna Schilling from UC Davis, and she's going to talk about a crystal for stable growth in the polynomials. Anna? Yeah, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. I hope it's okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I gave a talk in, uh, in Bangalore in December, or three talks. So this is sort of like a continue, continuation of the talk that, or the talks that I gave in Bangalore. But if you weren't there at that talk, that's okay, because I will introduce most of the concepts again. And so this is based on work by, uh, joint work with Jennifer Morse, and then also with my two students, Jinping Pen and Wen Chen Po. And that, that paper is on the archive. And can you see my cursor? So in case I'm pointing to stuff. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I want to start with first some motivation of why you would like to look at crystals. Um, so one uh, motivation for crystals is, for example, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. Um, and the Littlewood Richardson coefficient comes up in a lot of different uh, areas. So here I'm going, I'm just going to mention a couple. And first of all, so the Littlewood Richardson coefficient is indexed by partitions, lambda mu nu, so three partitions. And I write my partitions in French notation, um, where this partition, for example, would be just the partition four, this would be the partition two, two, three, one, and so on. And so the Littlewood Richardson coefficient comes up when you look at, for example, irreducible representations for GLN and you tensor two such representations if you uh, uh, write them again in terms of irreducibles then the multiplicity is the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. They also come up if you look at um, symmetric functions in particular Sure functions. So if you take the product of two sure functions, they form a basis of the ring of symmetric functions. Um, and then if you write them again in terms of sure functions, the coefficient is the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. And similarly, if you look at a skew sure function, if you write that again in terms of straight shaped sure functions, you get the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. And then finally, if you look at geometry, so if you look at intersections in the Grassmannian, you actually also will see the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. So, um, therefore, I mean, oh, I should say um, these are, in fact, integer, non negative integer coefficients, these Littlewood Richardson coefficients, as you can see, for example, from this a representation theoretic interpretation. So then as a combinatorialist, you become excited and you want to know what are they counting. And there is a, a nice way of counting them in terms of the Littlewood Richardson rule. So the Littlewood Richardson rule says that this uh, Littlewood Richardson coefficient lambda mu nu is given by the number of skew tableau of skew shape nu mod lambda. So you take this top partition and this lambda and you look at the skew shape and then you look at all tableau. So by, by tableau, I mean um, you fill it with numbers such that in every row it's weakly increasing and in every column it's strictly increasing. Okay, and you want that the weight is equal to mu, meaning so there will be mu one ones, mu two twos, and so on. And then there's one extra condition which says that the row of t, um, which means you just read your, since I'm doing French notation, you just read everything as if you were reading a book. So you look at that word and that should be a reverse lattice word, meaning if you read it actually from right to left, you will you always want to have more ones than twos, more twos than threes, and so on. So that's what the reverse lattice word means. 
And here's an example. So for example, if you want to compute S um, to one times S to one, and you want to know what is the coefficient of S three to one, then what you do is you take this shape three to one, you skew it by the two one. So then you get shapes like this, right? So where I filled in the numbers. And so then you want to look at tableau of weight mu, but mu is two one. So you want to put two ones and one two in there. And here are all possible skew tableau that satisfy this. And then the last thing you need to check is whether the reverse lattice condition is satisfied. So here the row word is two one one. Here it is one two one, and here it's one one two. And then you notice that this one here is not a reverse lattice word because if you read it from right to left, this one has more twos than ones. But these two are both reverse lattice words. So therefore, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient is equal to two. Does that make sense? If you have any questions, yeah. you just ask. And so if you look at um, Wikipedia, there's actually a, a nice quote by Gordon James on the Littlewood Richardson rule, which says, Unfortunately, the Littlewood Richardson rule is much harder to prove than was first suspected. The author was once told that the Littlewood Richardson rule helped to get men to the moon, but was not proved until after they got there. So the Littlewood Richardson rule was actually stated, I think, in 1934 by Littlewood and Richardson, but the proof was had some gaps. So there was not, not like a rigorous proof in that paper. And it took, I think, until like the 70s to, or even later to get the, to get a, a full proof. And now there are actually lots of proofs of the Little Wood Richardson coefficient, of the Little Wood Richardson rule. So one thing that I want to do now, remember I wanted to actually give you a motivation for crystals. So I want to now reformulate this rule in terms of crystals. So for that, I first need to tell you what a crystal is. And in this talk, I will actually give you a lot of crystals. So a crystal for a Stanley symmetric function, a crystal for Groton Dieck polynomials. But this one is sort of the most basic crystal in terms of tableau or words. Okay. And so we are just going to look at a tableau of a given shape. So remember tableau means you have a shape and you fill it such that a row is weakly increasing and columns are strictly increasing. Um, and then you look at the row word as before, you do the row reading. And now we are going to define these crystal operators, E, I, F, I, and there's also reflection operator, S, I, um, which does the following. So E, I, F, I, they only, act on the letters i and i plus one. Okay, so you in your word, you only look at the i and i plus ones. And then you successively bracket, whenever you see an i plus one before an i, you sort of bracket them. Or you can say i plus one is an open bracket and i is a closed bracket. And then you sort of bracket them successively. Um, and once you've done that, then you are left with a word of the form, like you sort of remove all the bracketed letters, and then you will have something of the form i to the r, i plus one to the s, right? Because there couldn't be any i plus one before an i, otherwise it would be bracketed. And then the rules are an e i takes away an i plus one and makes it into an i, right? So if you have i plus one to the s, it will become i plus one to the s minus one, and then you add one to this r. But of course, you can only do that if s is positive, right? You can't have a negative number of i plus ones. So this only is true if s is bigger than zero, and otherwise this ei annihilates this letter. 
And similarly, an Fi makes an I into an I plus one. And then the Si, actually, we won't need it much in this talk, but that just basically interchanges the number of unbracketed I's and I plus ones. Okay, so that those are the rules. And if you play around with that, you will actually see that if you do that on a tableau, so I've sort of now defined it on a word, but if you put your letters back into the tableau, you will still get a tableau. Okay, so the, the tableau condition that it's weakly increasing in rows and strictly increasing in columns is still satisfied. Okay, so now I want to give you the reformulation of the, the Littlewood Richardson rule. So now we here we are looking at a skew tableau, right, filled with letters from one up to three. And um, if you do your bracketing that I just um, defined, then this three here would be bracketed with this two, this three would be bracketed with this two, and then these threes would be unbracketed and this black two would also be unbracketed. So if you want to act with an E2 operator, remember that makes the leftmost unbracketed three into a two. So this three here will be made into a two and vice versa. So the E and the F are sort of partial inverses of each other. And well, one of the theorems in crystal theory is that um, if you look at the highest weight elements, meaning an element that's annihilated by all the EI, that will actually correspond to a connected component in, in your crystal graph, or um, in terms of representation theory, that would uh, correspond to an irreducible. Um, and if you think about it, when is something annihilated by an EI? Well, precisely if something is a reverse lattice word, right? Because all the twos will have to be bracketed with ones. So if you read from right to left, um, you always have to have weekly more ones and twos and so on. So therefore, you can actually reformulate the Littlewood Richardson rule by saying, well, it counts all tableau of the skew shape and weight mu, which are highest weight. So this reverse lattice condition in the crystal language really means it's, it's a highest weight element. Okay, so that's one of the motivations why, why crystals are, are nice. Um, and well, once you have that, you automatically actually also get a, a mechanism to get a sure expansion, namely um, the, the sure function, this uh, index by a skew shape, nu mod lambda. Well, if you think about how a sure function is defined, it's precisely the sum over all skew tableau of that skew shape, nu mod lambda. And then you take x to the weight, right? And these tableau are precisely the tableau that appear in our crystal. And I just told you that the irreducibles precisely correspond to highest weights in the crystal. So you actually get the sure expansion by only looking at highest weights in, in, uh, yeah, in, in this crystal. And then you actually get the sure expansion. So in fact, this is something that we are going to do. We are going to look at Stanley symmetric functions and then also Groton deep polynomials um, they are some, they're both symmetric functions and we want to get the Schuhe expansion. And what we are going to do is we take the combinatorial objects that underlie these, these, these other uh, symmetric functions and we are going to impose some crystal structure on, on those. Okay, and I briefly want to mention one variant of um, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient um, which actually comes from geometry because the, the Grotendieck polynomials actually also come from geometry. So 
this variant is actually indexed not by partitions, but by permutations. And I'm always going to write, no, not, not always, but in this section, I'm uh, indexing, or I'm going to write my uh, permutations in one line notation. So one, two, three means one is mapped to one, two is mapped to two, three is mapped to three, right? So it's a one line notation for a permutation. So two, one, three means one is mapped to two, two is mapped to one, three is mapped to three, and so on. Okay, and then, so the, the Littlewood Richardson coefficients, remember they came from the Grassmannian in terms of geometry. If you look instead at complete flags, um, then you get, and you look at the intersection of complete flags, then you get these these variants of the Littlewood Richardson coefficients. And in terms of polynomials, um, this would be if you take a Schubert polynomial or a product of two Schubert polynomials and you expand them again in terms of Schubert polynomials, you would get these, these coefficients. And one of the main open problems is actually what are these counting? So these are again integer, non-negative integer coefficients, but it, there's no rule yet for what these are counting. So if you are bored, you can try to find a rule right now. Um, so uh, is the other Littlewood Richardson coefficients special cases of these? Uh, not special cases because these are complete flags. And uh, the other case, the Littlewood Richardson uh, coefficients are for the Grassmannian. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. In the definition of a crystal, you have the operator SI, which interchanges the exponents of i and i plus one. Is that... uh, the SI? Yeah. It, yeah, the SI, they just interchange the number of i and i plus one. Yeah. But it can always be accomplished using uh, a sequence of EIs or FIs, right? Yeah, yes, you can do that too. So you can, you can look at your I string. So if you're at a given B, you can look at how often can I apply an FI? How often can I apply an EI? And then um, if the number of FIs that you can apply is bigger than the number of EIs, then it's FI to some power. And if there are more EIs that you can, that you can apply, then it would be EI to some power. Right. So uh, basically, a reflection in this I string. Oh, okay. Any uh, other questions? Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, so I thought that uh, Schur polynomials, if I take what is called a Grassmannian permutation, then the corresponding Schubert polynomial would be a Schur polynomial. That is, Schur polynomials are special cases of Schubert polynomials. And then Amri's question would have oh, a yeah. positive answer. Yeah, OK. Yes, and that, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? OK. So now. I'm not going to answer this question that I'm posing here because that's too difficult, but what we are going to do now, instead of looking at Schubert polynomials, um, we are actually going to look at what are called stable Schubert polynomials. And I first actually gave this talk in Sweden uh, like a couple of months ago. And in Sweden, they have um, pippy long stocking, I don't know. so because I gave it in Sweden, I, I took this picture. So we are going to have some fun now with the C Stanley symmetric functions. Um, so Stanley symmetric functions, they're actually stable limits of the Schubert polynomials. So you basically, they're, they're labeled also by permutations, but um, you, you basically put some identity part in front and you take this limit that m goes to infinity and that would give you the, the Stanley symmetric function. But I will give you a definition of these functions in a moment. Um, when 
W is three to one avoiding, and I will actually define later what precisely what three to one avoiding means, but if you look at the reduced word for W, if any reduced word, if none of the reduced words contains an I, I plus one I, so a braid, then it's called three to one avoiding. Or if you write it in one line notation, um, you cannot have any kind of pattern like a three, two, and then a one. So in this case, the Stanley symmetric function is actually known to be a skew sure function. And then in that case, we, um, we, we already know that the sure expansion would be given by the Littlewood Richardson coefficient. But in general, so not just when W is three to one avoiding, it's known by Stanley and Edelman Green that first of all, that these are symmetric functions and that they have a positive Schuh expansion. So I'm going to call these coefficients a W lambda. And I just want to briefly mention um, one reason why Stanley was actually interested in these Stanley symmetric functions. So for example, if you look at the square free term, then the coefficient of that uh, counts precisely the number of reduced words for W. Okay, so W, remember, is a permutation, and the set of all permutations or the group of permutations is can be generated by simple transpositions. So an SI interchanges an I and an I plus one. And these um, simple transposition satisfy the relations that if i and j are far apart, or at least two apart, then they commute. And if you have adjacent indices, then they satisfy these braid relations. As i as i plus one as i is equal to as i plus one as i as i plus one, and they also square to to one to the identity. So, for example. If you look at the permutation in one line notation given by three, two, one, four, then you can write this in terms of uh, these simple transpositions as S1, S2, S1. Or by this relation, you could also write it as S2, S1, S2. You could also write it as S3, S3, S1, S2, S3, but this is not reduced because S1, uh, sorry, S3 squared is equal to one. So by reduced, I mean, it's always the shortest word that, uh, that gives you um, the, the permutation. So in this case, the number of reduced words is actually equal to two. There are only two of them. And so Stanley showed that the square free term is pre precisely the number of reduced words. Okay, so now let me give you the definition. I have a, I have a yes. question. I didn't yes. quite understand. So what is that lamb square free term? Uh, I didn't quite understand the previous uh, FW is equal to sigma over lambda. Could you explain that please again once again? So sorry, what is it? So if, for example, if I take W to be 3214, mm -hmm. in this, in this uh, previous uh, ex this expansion that you have, yes. W, if W is equal to three, two, one, four, then yes, uh, then the coefficient of uh, x one, x two uh, would be equal to two because there are two reduced words. Uh, because I see a lambda there, and I'm a little confused. Uh, uh, this is a sure expansion, but this is just a monomial. Uh, so th this is different from the previous point. Uh, this point okay. is saying that in general for any W, you can actually write it as a sum of sure functions. Okay. But th this point is just talking about one particular monomial. So oh, 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 on okay. the next slide, on the oh, next slide, okay. I'm actually going to define the Stanley symmetric functions as a sum of monomials. And um, 
this point is just saying that if you look at the square free term where every xi appears exactly once, then that coefficient is equal to the number of reduced words. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, so I have a, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. In, uh, uh, in this expansion, what is A w lambda? Do we know what A w lambda signifies? Yeah, so I will actually give you an interpretation for the A w lambda, ah, like okay. later on. Okay. But um, okay. Edelman Green also gave an interpretation. Um, but uh, in terms of some Edelman Green insertion, which I will mention later, but I will give you an interpretation for the AW lambda in terms of crystals. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I have one more question. So in yes. this last statement here, this is just the specific monomial which takes the first uh, R variables. What is R here? Um, so in principle, so, in principle, um, you can always truncate your Stanley symmetric function. Um, uh, once I give you the definition, I think it's easier to explain. But, um, yeah, let me give you the definition and I come back to the question. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So, let me now give you the definition. And... So in this definition, R is actually equal to the number of factors um, in, my, in my factorization of this W. So what we are going to do is we are going to take our W and we are going to write it as, as a reduced expression, okay? But any reduced expression. So we are going to look at all possible reduced expressions. And we are now going to uh, put them into factors. So these V1, V upper one up to V upper R. So these upper indices are just indices. They're not like uh, powers or anything. Um, so they will be factors. And we are going to um, require that they are strictly decreasing. Okay. so. Uh, I will give an example in a second, but basically something like a 3, 1 would be strictly decreasing, but a 1, 3 wouldn't be because that would be increasing. So you want to put your, your, um, your reduced words into factors, into R factors, such that each factor is either empty or it's strictly decreasing. And you want that the length of W so the length of W is just the length of any reduced word for W is equal to the sum of the length of these factors. Hmm. Okay. So here's an example. So take W to be two, one, four, three. So the a reduced word for that would be S1, S3 or S3, S1. So there are only two reduced words. And what we want to do now is we want to put them into, into factors. And here I've chosen R to be equal to two. So you can choose how many factors you're going to allow. Okay, and that then actually your Stanley symmetric function will become a Stanley symmetric uh, polynomial in R variables. So R is basically the number of variables that, that you allow. If you allow infinitely many uh, factors, most of them would be empty and then you would actually get a, a symmetric function. So here in this case, um, if I take my reduced word one three, well, I can put each one of those into its own factor, right? A one by itself is decreasing, a three by itself is decreasing. Similarly for this one, I can put them in in separate factors, if I take one three, then that cannot be in a factor because that would be increasing, right? But for this one, the three one, I can put in a factor because that's decreasing. And I can either put it in the right factor or in the left factor. And then the corresponding monomial that I would get is precisely, well, 
the number of things in the first factor. So there's one, so I get an X1 or the number of factors in the second factor. So I have again, one thing in there. So I get an X2. Same for this one. Here I have two things in the first factor. So I get an X1 squared. And here I have two things in the second factor. So I get an X2 squared. So my Stanley symmetric function is in fact, um, the sum of these monomials. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, this is precisely uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, I have a the number of factors. I have a question. Yes. Uh, you count the second factor comes first. Yeah, so I'm counting from, like, if you look at this thing, I'm labeling from right to left. Ah, okay, nice. Yeah, nice. Like I'm calling the right factor, the first factor, and then. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. So when I look at S3, S1 in the third term, wow, what, what do you mean by S3, S1 having a strictly decreasing rate? Here, here for uh, this one? Yeah, yeah, okay. for that one. So I mean that the indices of ah, my. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Yeah, the indices are decreasing. Okay, okay, okay. So therefore, if I, I couldn't put okay. these two thanks. into a factor because they are the indices are increasing. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so this definition, right, gives us a monomial expansion of the Stanley symmetric functions. And what we want to do now is we want to impose a crystal structure on these to give us the Schuhe expansion. Um, and to do that, let us look again at how we defined crystals on skew tableau. And I'm going to give you a map, which is called the residue map, which actually gives, uh, goes from the skew tableau to decreasing factorizations. So here, here's just what we did before. Remember, First we did the pairing. So this three was paired with this two. This three is paired with this two. And then the E made this three into a two. So now I'm going to define this, this residue map. So now what we are going to do is we are going to label by sort of these diagonals. So I'm going to call this top diagonal the first diagonal. This would be my second diagonal, but there's nothing on there. This would be my third diagonal, fourth diagonal, fifth diagonal, and so on. So like the sub indices that I put are sort of labeling the diagonals. I hope that's clear. And then what we are going to do is we are going to put things into decreasing factors. So if I look only at the threes here, then the threes are in diagonal 10, 9, 8, 6, oh, and 1, right? So I put these numbers, the, the diagonals, I put them into a factor in decreasing order. And the same for the two, right? The twos are in diagonal 4, 5, 7. So I put the 4, 5, 7 in there. And if I also did that for the ones, which here I haven't done because we are interested in an E2, but then for the ones you would get six, five, three. Okay. So mm -hmm. to do an E2, we are now just going to look at these decreasing labels for, for the things in our tableau of label three and two. And now I need to explain to you what the pairing is. So for the pairing, we are looking at the right factor and we go from biggest to smallest. And we are going to look for something that is bigger in the factors for, for the twos, right? So I start with a 10, there's no, nothing bigger. So it's unbracketed or unpaired. Same for the nine, but the uh, same for the eight, but for the six here, there is something bigger for the twos, namely the seven. So the six and the seven are paired. And if you look back at your tableau, 
This was precisely this pairing between this three and this two. Okay, and now we keep going. So uh, the six is not paired because there's nothing. Um, oh, sorry, the six was paired, sorry. So now we are pairing the one. So the one will be paired with the smallest thing that's bigger. So it will be paired with this four. So the one is paired with the four. And again, that's precisely that what happened when we paired things in our tableau. So basically what we've now done is we've translated the pairing on the tableau to pairing on these decreasing factorizations. And then what does the E do? Well, the E takes the, um, it takes the most unbracketed letter, which was the eight, and it moves it to, to the next factor. So this eight moved to the second factor. And that's, again, that's precisely the three, which had label eight, became a two, so it went to the second factor. And this map um, that goes from skew tableau to um, this decreasing factorization is called the residue map. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, what is the eight paired with? The eight is not paired. Uh, then why is it moved? Can you explain again? Uh, yeah, so you pair, you pair, and the only thing that's paired is the six and the one. And then you move the rightmost unpaired thing over. So the eight was not paired. So I marked it in blue because it's a thing that moved, but the eight was not paired because there's nothing that's bigger than eight in, in the right factor. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I should just mention one brief, uh, one small caveat, namely what can happen is, so here I have an example here at the bottom. If you look at this example, the eight is paired with a nine, the five is paired with a six, the four is paired with a five, and the one is paired with a two. So the rightmost unpaired letter is this blue six, but we can't just move the six over because the six is sort of stuck by the five, right? You can't move a six past the five without changing the underlying permutation. Um, and also if you just move the six over, there's already a six here, and then you wouldn't get something that's strictly decreasing. So actually what you have to do in this case is um, you sort of have to use break relations. And if you do that, the six would actually move over and it would move to the first letter that doesn't appear over here, which is a four. So that's just a small sort of caveat, right? You, you do your bracketing, you look for the rightmost unpaired thing and you move it over, but sometimes that that letter becomes smaller due to break relations. Okay, so now the, these, these operations, uh, yes? Sorry, the last slide, that should be three, right? Uh, the uh, first thing not appearing there. Oh, it, but okay, so here what's not appearing is... So you the, cannot move the six, right? So, yeah, so... Yeah. So basically what you do is you move this, this six over, then you get a six, five, six. You use a braid relation. And then you keep using braid relations. And then um, it turns out that the, the, the letter that is moved over is precisely a four, not a three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So now what we are going to do is we are going to define uh, a crystal on these decreasing factorizations for W. Um, so the, the underlying vertices of my crystal graph are precisely these decreasing factorizations. The edges are given by these operations F, I, E, I that I defined on the previous slide. And then the highest weight elements are precisely the vertices that have no unpaired entries where you can't move things over. 
And that will give us, so we, we proved that this actually gives a real crystal graph. We proved that by checking what are called Stembridge local axioms. So they characterize a crystal. And I don't want to go into the details of that. Um, but we, I mean, you can prove that this is a crystal graph. And here's again an example. If we look at uh, the, the permutation that corresponds to the reduced word 3, 1, then it has two components, this component and this component. And if you only look at a, a 2, 1, then it only has one component. So the Stanley symmetric function given by this permutation 2, 1, 4, 3, which corresponded to this reduced word, uh, will be the sum of two sure functions, namely an S2 and an S11, because that's a weight, right? This, has, this thing has two things in the first factor, so that gives us an S2. This has one thing in the first factor and one thing in the second factor, so that gives us an S11. So that would give us the sure expansion. Uh, can I ask yes. a question at this point? Oh, maybe maybe yes. I'll wait until I see the next slide. Oh, yeah. So basically the theorem is now that we can now give the precise um, Schuh expansion. So we can actually give a combinatorial interpretation for these coefficients. Namely, they count precisely the highest weight elements in this factorization. Um, decreasing factorization such that the weight is precisely given by um, by that lambda. Do you still have a question now or is that answered? Uh, yes, so uh, it's more of a just checking if I, if I have understood it correctly. Um, so this uh, theorem gives uh, uh, um, so these now the coefficients a w lambda. Uh, I mean, in a sense, it's like saying um, instead of counting numbers, I have a full uh, crystal. Is that correct? Because this a w lambda was the number of factorizations uh, that was given by Stanley himself, right? That description. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, he didn't actually formulate it precisely that way. It's a slight like rewriting of his definition. But yeah, that's his definition. That's his definition. Now what Morse has done is given, you know, uh, sort of uh, expanded that AW lambda to be counting certain things and with a crystal structure. Is that yes. Yeah, so the, the, our definition was, so this definition of the Stanley symmetric functions is actually a monomial expansion because it, it's a sum of monomials. Mm -hmm. And what the theorem with Morse is doing is it now gives the Schuh expansion, not the monomial expansion. Uh -huh. okay. And this coefficient is now gives us precisely the highest weight elements in our crystal. Okay. So but let me, like, perhaps I briefly give this example. For example, if if you want F S2 S4, then this would be the crystal. It has two, uh, two components and therefore the Schuh expansion, this has weight, this highest weight has weight two, this highest weight has weight one one, so you get the Schuh expansion. Does that make sense or did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I do understand. but. I do have another question. If, okay. If, so I am a little confused with what are you doing with this uh, few tableau? Uh, why? Um, okay. So with a skew tableau, I only took that as a motivation for why I'm defining my my pairing this way. Uh -huh. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, in fact, this residue map, if you start with something that's a skew shape, 
then you will always, and you do this map that I gave you, then you will actually only get permutations that are three to one avoiding. So you're sort of going from something ah. skewed to something three to one avoiding. Okay. But, but my claim is that this pairing that sort of was motivated by doing this residue map from skew shapes actually works in general, even when things are not three to one avoiding. So that this example down here has braids. So that is not three to one avoiding, but my claim is that you can still use the same pairing and get a crystal structure. Yeah, so uh -huh. this, yeah, this map from from the skew tableau was sort of only motivational for now, but it will actually be more important when we talk about the growth and deep polynomials. But I'm therefore a little confused. So there are these, uh, so if this, uh, uh, this uh, map, the residue map, does it commute with the so it, uh, by by your motivation, yes. it commutes with the crystal operators, right? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, so I'm confused. So on the one hand, on the other side, I have the two Richardson rule, right? Because I'm looking at skew tableau. Uh huh. And on this side, I have Stanley symmetric function. I'm a little confused. Yeah. So remember when here on this slide, I said that when things are three to one avoiding. The Stanley symmetric functions are actually skew sure functions. Uh, but you are also saying now it works more generally. And yes, yes. So I only sort of did this residue map to motivate why I'm pairing things this way. So why I'm pairing a letter in the left factor with something bigger in the second factor. But I'm saying that this pairing still works even when it's not three to one avoiding. Uh, so, so that does that mean that does this that... proof using Stembridge local axioms? So I mean, you have to you can't just use the usual crystal on Tableau to prove in this case that what I'm defining is actually a crystal graph. Because there is, in general, there is no map to something that's known. Uh, I mean, at least this residue map doesn't work in that case. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit lost. I, uh, so this, this, uh, the a, the coefficients when I expand the Stanley symmetric function in terms of the Schur polynomials. Mm -hmm. That is not the Littlewood Richardson coefficients no, in no, general, right? No. But then no. you're saying that you're saying that something works in general. So yes. Uh, so, so I'm a little confused there. Maybe could you clarify that, please? So I thought. If, okay. Uh, so this coefficient is equal to the Littlewood Richardson coefficient when W is three to one avoiding. Okay, got that. I got that. But then you are saying that when as we suppose W is not three to one avoiding. Yes. So this is, these are not the Littlewood Richardson coefficients then in that case. Correct. Uh -huh. okay. uh, but then you're saying this map, this residue map works in general. Yourself. No, no, no. Forget uh -huh. about the residue map. Uh -huh. uh, no, that doesn't work in general. What works is this, this construction works. So, uh -huh. so, so this take, part... take decreasing factorizations, mm -hmm. do the pairing which is now defined without the residue map. Mm -hmm. So the pairing is still defined. Mm -hmm. And then you move a letter over. So that's now my crystal operator. Mm -hmm. And my claim is that that still works even when it's not three to one avoiding. Okay, I think I finally got it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so yeah, the last thing I want to mention about the, um, the, uh, the, this crystal that I just defined is, so 
there is actually a map back to the usual um, crystals that I defined at the beginning, but it's not the residue map. It's given by what's called the Edelman green insertion. So I, I don't want to define it, but there is some insertion where you would take your uh, decreasing factorizations, you do some insertion, and if you look at the recording tableau, then the crystal operators that I defined on these decreasing factorizations um, under this Edelman Green insertion would go to the, the crystal operators on tableau. So B lambda is really just the crystal on tableau of shape lambda, and this B W is the crystal on these uh, decreasing factorizations. Okay, so that 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 is a crystal isomorphism. Okay, so now we are going to have some more fun. So this is another character of uh, Astrid Lindgren from Sweden. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to now define a crystal for uh, the the Grotendieck polynomials, um, and just to sort of put Grotendieck polynomials into perspective, right? So if we have the Grassmannian, then remember we got the Schur functions. When we looked at the flag varieties, we got Schubert polynomials, or in the stable limit, we got these Stanley symmetric functions. If you now look at K theory, then um, in the Grassmannian case, you get uh, Grotendieck polynomials um, labeled by, again, partitions. And if you look at the flag case, then you, you look at, um, we are actually going to look at stable Grotendieck polynomials, which are again indexed by permutations. And so in the Grassmannian case, they were defined by Lascaux, Schutz, and Berger. And uh, for, for the general W, they were defined by Fomin, Kirillov. And again, they, these uh, stable Grotendieck polynomials have a positive Schur expansion. And the question is can we define a crystal structure on, uh, on the object that underlies these stable Grotendieck polynomials to get the Schur expansion? And what we are going to do is we are going to sort of combine the crystal structure on decreasing factorizations that I, I just defined. So that was this joint work with Jennifer Moores. And we are going to go combine it with a crystal structure, well, for the um, sigma lambda, um, which are given in terms of set value tableau um, given by Monica Pechenik and Scrimshaw. And since I'm, I, I only have an hour, right? So I am sort of running out of time. So I'm probably just going to define for you the, the, the Grotendieck polynomials and then give you the crystal and then just hand wave about some of the properties. Well, I mean, so, we, we, it's, it's still early morning for us, so we're not in a great hurry, but I guess for you, it's probably late in the night, so. Yeah, well, anyway, let me. And you can go on longer if you like. Well, I don't want to bore people, but. No, 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 this is great, yeah. So feel free to take a little longer if you like. Uh, if I may make a suggestion, uh, we could, I know, our seminars run for more than a week, so we could have another talk again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's true. I could, I could like. Um, give a second part of the talk next week or something if you want to but but yeah. perhaps I, I i at least like briefly um define the grotendieck polynomials for you sure so what what did we do previously for the stanley symmetric functions there we looked at reduced words for um the the, the underlying permutation so now, instead of looking at Sn, we are actually going to look at the zero hacker monoid. And it looks very similar to the symmetric group, except that the relations are slightly different, right? So 
For the symmetric group Sn plus 1, we had n generators, S1 up to Sn. So they now correspond to basically the letters that I have, 1 up to n. And now we are going to look at words in the letters from 1 up to n, and we impose these relations. So this relation is sort of the same as the braid relation. PQP is, is congruent to QPQ. Okay, and before that actually only held for adjacent uh, letters, but now this is actually true in general. So for any PQ from 1 up to n, we are going to have this relation. And then when P and Q are far apart, again, they commute as before. But before, remember, SI squared was equal to the identity. So now in this case, PP is actually equal to P. So P is an idempotent. So that, that is really sort of the, the change from before. Okay. Um, so for example, 2, 1, 1, 2, well, in the symmetric group, this would really be the identity because 1 squared would be the identity and then 2 squared is the identity. But in this zero hackamonoid, well, 1, 1 is equal to 1. So this is actually congruent to 2, 1, 2. And then you can use the braid relation. So that is also congruent to 1, 2, 1. Um, so this is not equal to the identity in the, in the zero hacker monoid. And here's another example. If you look at 2, 1, 2, 1, well, now you could, you could, oops, you could use the braid relation to make the 2, 1, 2 into 1, 2, 1. The 1, 1 is equal to 1. So this is, e this is also congruent to 1, 2, 1 or 2, 1, 2. And similarly, if you look at 3, 1, 3, 1, 2, then, well, this is congruent to, well, you can move this 1 over, like you can commute that with a 3, and then 1, 1 is equal to 1, so that's, e that's congruent to 3, 1, uh, 3, 2. Um, and then you can move the 3 over, so that's congruent to 3, 1, 2, and the 1 and the 3 commute, so this is also congruent to 1, 3, 2. So it's very similar to the symmetric group, but it, it's slightly different. So I hope, I hope that's clear. Um, so now we are, what we are going to do to define the, the Grotendieck polynomials is we are going to now define decreasing factorizations in this zero hacker monoid instead of reduced um, words for, for the W. Okay, so now we are going to define a decreasing factorization for a word in, in the zero hacker monoid. Okay, so now I call it the factors M instead of R, but you are just going to write this again as like a product of m factors um, where each factor is, is strictly decreasing and you want that this h is in with these relations that I just defined congruent to w. And we are going to define hwm to be the set of all decreasing factorizations of w into m factors. So here's an example. If let's say we take the word 132 um, and we want to look at all words of length five. So by length, I now really mean the number of letters, not like uh, the length of a reduced expression, right? So when I say now length, I mean, I'm going to take five letters and I want to write this into decreasing factorizations into three factors, then these are all, all the decreasing factorization. So as before, right, we, we put things decreasing into factors and we can use our relations to move things around and then you get these um, 
yeah, these decreasing factorizations. And um, yeah, well, since I'm basically out of time, let me just give you the, the definition for the stable Grotendieck polynomial. And then if you want me to speak again next time, I can then talk about the crystal next time, if that's OK. So the, the stable Grotendieck polynomial is now defined very similar to the Stanley symmetric function. So now you take the, um, the decreasing factorizations of this into m factors. And you just take the, the corresponding monomial. And the, the only sort of difference to the function is that you have this extra parameter beta. So beta sort of keeps track of what's called the excess. Because if w is, let's say, a permutation, Remember, we, we can have now words that are sort of longer than the length of the actual permutation. So this beta sort of keeps track of how much longer things are. So the, the stable Grotendieck polynomials are not any more um, uh, homogeneous as the Stanley symmetric functions were. Um, and the beta basically now keeps track of each homogeneous component. Um, but, uh, so, sorry, is this unbounded? You can yeah, it's unbounded. Yes, it is. Because they can now be as long as you basically want. Yes, it's unbounded. Thanks. Yeah, so you can, you can have degrees in beta that, that are as, as big as you want. And well, let's take this w to be 1, 3, 2. There are two reduced words. Um, and well, these would be the decreasing factorizations of the reduced words. And those would be precisely the constant term. And the constant term is precisely the Stanley symmetric function. But then you also get higher order terms, right? And so the, the, the constant term we sort of already understand because we already know what a crystal is for that. And well, if I'm going to speak again next week, then what we are going to do is we are going to define a crystal for not just the constant term, but for the, the higher order terms. So I think this is a good place to stop. OK, uh, let's thank Anna for this wonderful talk. Uh, questions? Anybody have questions? Uh, I do, but I can wait uh, uh, until you tell me. Does anybody besides Raghavan have questions? Um, okay, let's take Raghavan's question. Okay, so uh, here is the question. So you have this, uh, so uh, this FW, the Stanley symmetric function, now you have the crystal structure for it. That is the theorem either with Morse or by Morse himself. I didn't check that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's with, it's with in joint work with Jennifer Morse, yes. Jennifer Morse, okay. Um, uh, my question is, is there uh, a representation theoretic interpretation that is given a permutation W, is there an interpretation of the representation of which this is the uh, show, uh, this is the character. Um, I ask because in the Littlewood Richardson case, you have a representation theoretic interpretation. Um, yeah, so I think in the paper we have, um, we, we have some interpretation in terms of representations for the symmetric group. Um, in terms of certain uh, Specht modules. And um, that actually uses this uh, Edelman green correspondence that I mentioned. So yeah, there, there is some uh, representation theoretic interpretation. 
So uh -huh. uh, is it like a representation of the symmetric group whose uh, Frobenius characteristic is this? Uh... Yes, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> Uh, thank yes. you. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 